you remember what happened last week was that I moved this and the trolley moved and fell off the floor. And it took a bit of a sort of, why does that happen? Why when you move something and the other thing just stays where it is and it falls off, is that going on? So what, what was the thinking behind that? What's the reason for that? So it's staying in the same place as the wheels I'm moving. Okay, but, but why does it do that? Air resistance. Not quite. There wasn't enough friction to keep it in some space. Okay, so it did, there wasn't enough friction to keep it in contact with the thing that was moving. And so, Alistair? By Newton's first law of motion, which it's not really the question is, why did it stay where it was? The question an object needs to answer is, why should I move in the first place? So things will inherently just stay where they are unless it's a good reason for them doing something else. It's a bit like the sort of trick where you have um, a set of glasses on top of the table cloth and the idea is you can pull the tablecloth away and the glasses stay where they are. You might want to try that at all. So the sort of thing is that you pull this away from underneath and the trolley stays exactly where it is. It's Newton's first law of motion. Things generally don't like moving and only when you put an external force on something will it actually move in the direction which you're hoping it will move. So going back to our mysterious pink man here. Woman. Can't really tell from you. Do you know what? We're, we're going to have outtakes on this. <laughs> There's going to be about a dozen bits of this guy falling off, and he shouldn't. So it goes around in a constant uh, angular velocity and quite happy. Uh, I hope you're getting this in extreme close up, Gregor. <laughs> so we've got the guy there. And this is just generally what happens. Only once we start to increase the angular velocity fall off. question is, why does he fall off? Well, let's have a think about if you put a ball bearing onto a turntable like this. This is going to be the tricky thing, trying to get the thing level in the first place. Thanks, man. So if you put a ball bearing on here and set the, the ball and set the turntable going. What do you think will happen to the ball bearing? Well, it'll just stay. Well, it'll just stay in the same place. Okay, so you're reckoning it'll just stay where it is. You're reckoning it's going to. Okay. Any other ideas? Which way do you reckon it will shoot off? Chris? Like a straight line. Straight line from there. Okay. Mathematically, what would you call that line if you've got a circle? You get a straight line going off. Tangent. Yeah, so basically Chris is going off at a tangent on this. So it's just going to go off there. Um, any other ideas? Don't you're just saying it'll do very little? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Find out. Okay. So if we start moving, try it again. Its initial thing is as soon as the surface underneath it starts rolling, it tends to keep going the way it's going. It just tends to stay where it is. It just rolls and would quite happily stay there and then just turn it. It actually stays where it is. Because it's a rolling surface, there's no friction. It's different that it's frictionless. You can actually make the thing go round round the circle because the force of friction gets the thing moving in the first place and then it will keep it moving. If we get to the stage where we put that just there and it is restrained and we have got a force there which gets it moving in a circle and it will follow that circular motion but if we make it go too fast it then follows Chris's motion of going off at a tangent so what actually why, do, why does this happen is that a tangent I went it would be if we were able to just play this back frame by frame and show that when it comes off, it actually goes off at a tangent. Well, of course, we do have a. That's good point, actually. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Did you hear it? I think it does. So, our reaction, uh, what we, we should find 
is that once it comes off the tangent, as soon as it loses contact with the boat, it goes at a, a ruler straight line like that. You questioned it initially, Donald. You said, would it go off at a tangent? What other shape do you think it would follow? Straight at the radius. So you said, go out radially? In that direction like that, and Ben, you were saying it would kind of curve in a bit, but eventually go out? Yeah. Okay, so does it follow a sort of curve, a radial straight line, or a tangential straight line? Okay. Good, good thinking, good description. Let's just try and take you through one by one. A radial line going out, so you're saying, Don, that it's been released from keeping itself in a circle, so it's going to shoot out that way. Mm. Okay. You're saying, Ben, that it's going around in a circle, so it, it would really like to keep going around in a circle, but it's lost that force to make it go around in a circle, so it's going to eventually head off in that tangent. And you were saying, well, as soon as it loses the frictional contact with the turntable, it immediately forms this sort of straight line, this tangent line. What's the thoughts? Very difficult to get the evidence to support that because it happens so quickly, but what would your thinking be that would support one of those arguments? Mm, well, it's initial sort of velocity in one direction. Okay. So it's going in that direction at the moment when it loses contact with the turntable. So what would be its... Keep going again. Right, why will it keep going in a straight line then? It has no reason not to. Exactly, it's going with Newton's first law of motion. Once it loses contact with it, there's no one force acting on it, so it should just continue on a straight line. Now, our initial reaction, as you said, Ben, is that, oh, well, it's probably going in a quirk, it'll sort of go in a sort of curve, and then finally off. What we'll try and do is analyse the video and see if it does just go with it in a straight line. Okay. You can do something similar if you get um, a, a rubber band on the end of a <coughs> bit of string or a an iPod headphone or something like that and you can spin it round and then release it or even better if the string snaps the thing will shoot off and if you were to see that it would actually just go straight off at a tangent in a straight line. So we've got this idea that things are held into circular motion by a force and if the force isn't there they would rather travel in a straight line so just to keep something going round at constant acceleration sorry a constant angular velocity actually requires a change not in speed but in direction. So what is changing for that ball bearing at the moment? It's got constant speed. <coughs> constant. It's a momentum. There is a change in momentum. The mass is staying the same, so what must be a force or direction. There's a force to make it change its direction. Okay, so there must be a force on it. Impulse. Um, it's happening over a longer period of time, so I wouldn't classify it as an impulse. Impulse over shorter pe periods of time. But we've said that its speed is constant, but its direction's changing. So what's changing? The velocity. The velocity's changing. It's got a changing velocity. And if something's got a changing velocity, normally we would say that it's... <coughs> Excited. We'd normally say it's got acceleration. <laughs> but you know, it's not speeding up, is it? We need a constant... One radian per second or something there. So we've actually got quite an unusual case of acceleration where we've got something going at constant speed, but it is accelerating. Where is it accelerating towards? If it's changing direction. Yeah. Without that acceleration, it'll go off at a tangent. With the acceleration, it is constantly being shifted in towards the center. It's going in that direction, shifting its direction a little bit, going that way, going that way, going that way. It's constantly being pushed in towards the centre. never reaches the centre, but it's always got a force directing it in towards the centre. You briefly covered this kind of force at the end of fourth year. What has a force which constantly provides a force towards the centre of a circle? Centrifuge. And it's that that keeps... It's a... Centrifugal. Right, we'll come back to this word centrifugal in a moment because it's, it's one of the sort of words that common language is hijacked which actually doesn't fit with the physics. 
but it's that kind of idea, Gregor. So it's, we'll discuss centrifugal, centrifugal as a force. But in terms of standard gravity, right at the end in space physics, what bit of space physics has some has something moving in a circle, which is constantly being pulled towards the centre circle? Satellite orbit. So if you've got a satellite, it's constantly trying to fall down to Earth. It's constantly being attracted to the centre of the Earth, but it never reaches the centre of the Earth because it's always following a circular orbit. The force which actually holds something in is called the, just the central force. It is also called centripetal force, but at advanced high we just call it central force. So for something to go around in a circle, there must be a central force holding in, in towards the centre of the circle. If there is no central force, it either stays where it is, or once it's going, it follows that tangent out. So without a central force, things don't follow the circle. What do you think the central force might, or the something central acceleration? If we just think about the acceleration, if something's accelerating in towards the centre of a circle, what will affect the central acceleration of something? The speed of the disk moving around. Okay, so the, is that the <coughs> angular speed or the linear s speed? Uh, angular speed. Okay, so the angular speed here, how? F the number of radians per second that that's describing. Obviously, it's easier to stay... Where's the pink man? It's easier for him to sit there um, at low angular revolutions per second, radians per second, than it is at bigger radians per second. It falls off. How could a spin the turntable at quite a high revolution, but still it would fall... Wouldn't fall mm, radius of it. Okay, so if we put them at a smaller radius, if we make the radius smaller, we can actually go much faster without falling over. Okay, so that kind of angular velocity out here falls straight off. So it does depend on omega and the radius that we can have. So, in fact, the there is a derivation which I can show you which, well sorry, there is a derivation which we will have to do which takes you from the change in velocity of something going around the circle, how it does make these small changes in velocity and how it can relate that to the angular velocity and to the radius and get the force which is required to hold something into a circle just by using those two. So, Right, okay, so there's, there's various equations that you need to be able to use and you'll be using these a lot both in terms of what we're doing with rotational dynamics but also in terms of when we look at gravitation and satellites held in by gravitational attraction so just put this in it's about central force so we're trying to get central acceleration and the so this is for something which is going round in a circle, and it's describing a rotational velocity, angular velocity omega, and it's traveling at a radius r. Central acceleration is always acting towards the center, and so we've got a equals r omega squared. As I say, I'll come back to where we get a equals r omega squared from in terms of a derivation, but it depends on the radius, but it depends on the square of the angular velocity. So that makes it a little bit more important in terms of how fast something's spinning. Omega squared would be radians per second, radians would be in meters, and this is the acceleration that it's experiencing towards the center. So this is a linear acceleration. It's saying how many meters per second per second is it accelerating towards the center of the circle, quite different from the angular acceleration alpha which is the rate of change of omega. So we've got quite a different thing there. That's one equation for the, the central acceleration. You can express central acceleration in terms of V and R. So how could we get an acceleration for you, the linear speed that something was traveling and the radius? Can you replace omega in that equation by anything to do with r and linear speed v? 
that would give you the equation in terms of the other two? Sana. So just a second, let's take that step by step. I think you're on the right track here. Uh, so we're using omega v over r. And so, yep, so we've got omega squared, we've got v squared over r squared. Okay. Okay. So you've got a equals v squared over r. So two important ways to get the same thing. This is the radial acceleration, the central acceleration towards the center of a circle for something traveling in the circle. You can either use a equals r omega squared, or if you've got the linear velocity, assuming that it's traveling at constant angular velocity, you can use that one there. Okay, so that would be a meters per second. That would be a meters, and it would still return meters per second per second. And that would work in terms of the dimensions there.